Is switching to Ubuntu. Yeah, that's the largest Linux distribution. So it's most user friendly, right? Huh? It's most user friendly? Yeah, they try to be like OSX, like elements in it. So. But it's much more customized. I don't know, it's more regulated, like it's more, they, they have like right. a non profit group of programmers yeah. writing drivers and stuff. You don't have to like write your own drivers just to get it to work. So, I want to do that. <laughs> well, you're not hardcore though. No. Yeah. All right, I guess we should start. Um, yeah, it's coming. Oh, you already got <laughs> it? Yeah, I just wanted to. Okay, next time, moments. tell me when you turned on. It's not candid if I do that though. <laughs> All right, let, let me start with questions. Are there any um, questions? Let's see, you get a candy for uh, running the... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. You notice I brought a second bag in case we run out. So we were talking about electrodynamics, and um, we have found that because of Gauss's law, which is spelled out E is rho over the electric constant. Um, and in the Coulomb gauge, where L dot A is zero, um, we could write A zero as an integral of J zero y and t dq y over 4 pi x minus y. And, yeah, let me say what j0 is. j0 here is a rho over c epsilon 0. Now, um, I've, I've been in MKS and um, I'm, I'm going to sort of make the transition to natural units, and um, I hope that um, this uh, is that there are no um, bumps in the road. Um, now um, I'm going to post these notes online and uh, tonight, and then I'm going to switch during the lecture to chapter 16, which is the chapter on path integrals um, in the middle of the lecture. And then, um, I think on Wednesday, I'm going to do this, the path integrals for electrodynamics in terms of coherent states. I think there are two reasons for that. One is, I think it will be clearer. And secondly, um, well, there's a lot of interest in optics in this department, and coherent states are the best way to probably do, <coughs> do quantum optics. Notice that in this expression here, the dependent field variable A0 in the Coulomb gauge responds to changes in the charge density instantaneously everywhere. Doesn't sound right. Huh? Doesn't sound right. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's mathematically right, physically right. Um, what you're worried about is relativity, and of course the the, the fact is that the um, the theory is nonetheless relativistically invariant. Any physical effects would be relativistically invariant. Um, I we'll see that in one sense that when we get to the path integral, you'll see everything. It, it, it takes a covariant form. Um, uh, let me, uh, I'll just have to think about, I, I, I can't say immediately why it'll be clear that everything's okay, but it is. Um, so we're not, we're not, um, not violating special relativity in any, any sense. So this is a dependent variable, a dependent field, I should say. And um, so what we do is we have 
three fields here, although we don't really even have three because we um, only have uh, effectively two because these are, co uh, are uh, in the Coulomb gauge. They're transverse, in other words. And, um, and as we saw last time, pi i is the partial derivative of the drawn density with respect to, let us say, uh, a i dot. And um, so this is um, another way of writing it is partial with respect to e0 a i 1. And um, pi 0 is 0. And in fact, you can see that if you set i equal to 0, you have the derivative of L with respect to the time derivative of A0. Well, a, the time derivative of A0 doesn't appear in the Lagrange. So that's why this thing is 0. Um, the, the action, of course, is in fact, let me maybe write down the whole action. It's um, is an integral minus a quarter um, DAAB minus DBAA times DAAB minus DBAA. And then uh, plus JB, AB, and then plus any matter will draw in density, D4 of A. So that's what uh, that is. And another way of writing it is an integral a half P squared minus P squared uh, plus J dot A minus J0, A0 plus LM, D4 of X. Okay, so if we now want to, um, well, let's see, what is pi i, I should have said what that is. Pi i then is simply um, a i dot. And so now we can form the Hamiltonian, and what we do is we say that the Hamiltonian density is pi i a i dot uh, minus l. And so this is pi i squared minus a half e squared plus a half b squared minus j dot a plus j zero a zero. I'm going to leave out the matter. Let's leave out the, the matter with Roger because it's just, it just floats along as sort of a um, Passenger, what's the phrase that one uses for something that we don't care about? Okay, so anyway, this thing, this is pi i, by the way, pi, pi zero. So this, of course, is pi i squared. And um, what is e? Well, this is minus a half pi plus grad a zero squared plus a half curl A squared minus J dot A plus J zero A zero. Sir, what's the symbol to the right of the pi i? First line, pi i squared minus one half something. Then the e. This is pi vector. Yeah, sir. OK, so, and, and this comes from our formula for e. And um, let me just recall that formula for you. It's earlier here in the notes. Um, e is um, C, whoops, hold on. C gradient A0 minus a dot. And, ah, good, lower a zero. So 
So that means that it's minus C gradient upper A0 minus A dot. And I just lost the minus sign here because it's the square. Okay. Is this sun bothering you? I enjoy it. It's keeping me warm. <laughs> Cold blooded. Okay. Let's see. Did you you asked your question? So you need to get out of the that was a real question. <laughs> that was a real question. Alright, is somebody starving? Here we go. <laughs> Anybody else starving? Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to ask questions, though. Well, I'll follow up with the question. Sorry, I forgot. I, all right. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you. I don't you remember what. Yeah. Yeah. Will you get the answer to that one? Um, so this pi i equals a dot i, can you remind me why that's the case? Yeah, especially why pi i is a i dot? Yeah. Well, good, good question. Let's just do it explicitly then. Um, here is the Lagrange density, okay? So, let me come over here. So. What we're doing, what we're saying is pi i is this derivative here. Partial of L with respect to, let us say, d0 ai. Okay, well what we've got up there is, for example, minus a quarter d0 ai minus di a0 D0 AI minus DI A0, and then there are other terms, and in particular, there's going to be a term, so I'm just putting the terms that have an I and a zero. There'll be a term minus a quarter uh, DI A0 minus D0 AI times <coughs> DI A0 minus D0 AI. So these are the only relevant terms in this action that involve time derivatives of AI. And now we differentiate. So we're taking the derivative of the <coughs> So the derivative of this with respect to D0 AI. Okay. Well, what do we get? Well, we get minus a quarter. We're going to get this term. And what does it multiply? Well, it multiplies this. And so that is um, d0 ai minus di a0. And actually, I'm I'm a little bit surprised that I had forgotten about this term. Um, and then over here, it um, it will come. Uh, we we can differentiate this one. Well, you can also differentiate this one, and. If you lower the zero here and raise the zero there, you just get two of these. So this gives two of these. And then this one over here, you can differentiate <coughs> with respect to that. So you start out getting minus a half di, well, it'd be plus a half <coughs> di a0 minus d0 ai, because you differentiate with respect to this one. But then again, there are two of them. So this is two halves. So altogether, what you have is. Um, I'm sorry, I seem to have missed it. Where are you getting this two from? Where? What am I getting the two from? Yes, the two over four. So are you in front of this? Well, I, you see, you can, you you have a d zero ai here, but you also have a d zero ai there. 
and then you also have two over here. So altogether you have four of them. And um, what's, what's actually bothering me at the moment here is that um, I'm picking up not simply not simply this term, minus d0 ai, but also a di a0. And um, ah, this is, you see what you're getting here is the total uh, pi. But the pi that we're talking about that we want to quantize is the transverse part. This part here is not transverse. It's, you know, it's explicitly not transverse because it's a gradient of something. And that's the essence of being non-transverse. Yeah, actually, we've got a bit of a problem here. Well, <laughs> I think it's OK, actually. You see board despite Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's quite all right. OK, but now you're wanting to you get more sun if you want here. Very true, but then when you're crossing back and forth in about five minutes, I'll kind of be in your all way. Right, all right, all right. Well, you, you know best. Over here. All right, let's use this. Okay, so the transverse part. And, and now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of um, the, the transverse part. So I think Weinberg used a little purpose sign there. So the transverse part of that is then um, minus d0 a upper i. And this d upper 0 is d0 ai, and this is what we mean by ai dot. So that's finally the derivation. Um, so that's what we've got up here is um, <coughs> we <don't coughs> So, yeah. Is that, so is that a gauge freedom that you use to get rid of the dia0, or is that something else. Yeah, AI is the electromagnetic field, which right. is something that under gauge transformations transforms. But where what, we're, what we've done here is we've gone to the Coulomb gauge. So I guess what I'm asking is, are we in like a gauge for which DIA0 vanishes, or are we just talking about it? Yeah, part? right. We're in a gauge in which the gradient of um, the divergence of A vanishes and the divergence of pi oh, you did vanishes. That. And um, so in particular, this thing is, um, is has a divergence. And so we, we drop that term from this. So what we have then is This structure here, let me go over here now and continue this calculation. Um,
Well, we're going to multiply this out. One of the terms cancels, and so we get one half. But I, I think I can just call this pi squared um, plus a half curl a squared. And then we have a cross term, which is minus pi dot grad a zero, and then minus a half um, grad a zero squared and then minus j dot a plus j zero a zero. And um, now, this thing is, um, we can integrate by parts. If we integrate by parts, this turns into plus a zero dot uh, divergence of pi. So this is pi dot. And uh, on the other hand, pi is transverse, so that's zero. And so what we have then is a half pi squared plus a half curl A uh, squared. And um, we then just have this term, minus a half grad A zero squared minus J dot A plus J zero, A zero. Okay, now this of course is all under an integral sign because we're computing the Hamiltonian, which is the space integral of that. Now the question is what do we do about this? Well, what we do is we have we have integral minus a half grad A zero squared d cubed x. So we integrate by parts and we get that this is a zero right squared a zero d cube x. And then on the other hand, we've seen that somewhere over here we've seen that okay, I didn't I I, I solved for it, but it's that well we can see it here. If you take grad <coughs> minus grad squared minus grad squared on this gives us j0. So minus grad squared a0 is j0. So this thing here is a half integral a0, the minus sign, j0, t cubed x. So that combines with this, and so our total Hamiltonian then is an integral a half pi squared plus a half curl a squared. This is gone. This then is this, and combining with that gives us <coughs> minus j dot a plus a half j zero a zero d cubed x. So this is our Hamiltonian. Now, you might say, well, what is that funny term, a half j0, a0? That's just the Coulomb energy. So, in fact, it's, I go over there, let me see if I can get another eraser. Though. Okay, we have a zero is this. And um, so what we have then is one half uh, a zero j zero d cubed x integrated. Well there's a zero, so this is one half integral j0 of x and t, let us say, and then a0 of x and t is this, j0 y of t, 4 pi, x minus y, d cubed y, d cubed x. So this is the Coulomb term, which I'm going to write as v sub c. And with all the coughing, and I'm, I mean, 
you know, we'd all get to be in the hospital tomorrow. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll turn these fans up on high. They'll never escape. Actually, this one's kind of noisy. Maybe, should we open a window? Try to escape all you want. <laughs> Why don't you open the door? And if you want to open one, I, I think... Yeah, uh, you, you use, you use this, this doohickey. Yeah, open the two, but they use the corresponding doohickey to raise the thing, maybe a foot. Open this box almost in chalk. One piece is not broken. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we've got then is that the Hamiltonian This way, when we do this pi, is we take the derivative with respect to the transverse part, because this thing is transverse at this point. That's why the pi is effectively transverse. Anyway, the Hamiltonian is an integral then of um, a half pi squared plus a half curl A squared minus A dot J d cubed X plus VC. This is one way of thinking about it. Notice that this VC is such that the uh, it increases the energy when J zeros, when, if you have two J zeros that have the same sign, or in other words, J zero is delta of X minus X one, and this is delta of Y minus X two, say, and uh, then you get a positive contribution. So <coughs> light charges repel. If you had this was minus delta of y minus x2, you get a negative contribution. So opposite charges uh, lower the energy and subtract. Um, all right, so now the question is how do we? Uh, how do we represent the quantization of this? Uh, what we want, and remember now, we're, we're in, um, we just have the spatial indices, and then in this Weinberg metric, the spatial indices, you can raise and lower them, and they're always positive. There are no minus signs to trip you up. So this is. Okay, so what is this commutator? Well, these are both transverse fields. So instead of being simply delta ij delta q of x minus y, which would make our lives simple, there's an extra term. <coughs> partial q, partial xi, partial xj of 1 over 4 pi x minus y. So th this is also sometimes called the transverse delta function. I delta IJ transverse. Well, I don't even know how to say it. It's, it's, anyway, it's called the transverse delta function. I don't even know, I can't even think of a good notation for it. On the other hand, we do have a i a j equal to pi i pi j equals zero at equal times. Notice these were at the same time. So they, so they would not commute at different times. Give me that again. They would not commute at different times then. Uh, in general, that's right. I'm afraid to touch it. Um,
Okay, well, as with so many things in this course, um, life and position space is confusing, but if you switch to momentum space, it's a lot clearer. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, we're going to represent these commutation relations by introducing annihilation and creation operators. And these are going to have simpler commutation relations. Delta lambda lambda prime, delta q, k minus k prime. Yes. Why is that the case Like that it's easier to analyze in momentum space? Why is it easier? Yeah, like in this context, I guess. Because um, you said throughout this course. That's well, it, 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 what happens is it was the insight basically of Fourier who notice that um, if you have a differential equation in which you just have a lot of derivatives, you take the Fourier transform and it turns into an algebraic equation. d by dx turns into k. Right, or, well, yeah, Laplace does it also, but um, anyway. Um, now, so, so that's that's the case, and, and you see what you've got monkeying things up are these derivatives. Yeah. So these derivatives, it turns out. So if you see derivatives, just try to. These derivatives make it simpler. In fact, this is the commutation relation, but notice, I didn't tell you what lambda and lambda prime are. They're plus and minus. In other words, for a circular polarization, this way or that way. Yes. He, he, I, this is not worthy of talking about, but you haven't told us what little a is, have you? I haven't told you what? Have you told us what little a is? Yeah, it's an <coughs> annihilation operator. But does this fully define it, or are you going to define this it? This is an annihilation operator, this is a creation operator. This annihilates a photon of circular polarization lambda momentum k. Okay. And that's all the definition that you need of it. And this is the creation operator. This creates a photon of polarization lambda prime and momentum k prime. And the commutator is very simple. It's just a delta function. But okay. notice there are only two lambdas, whereas here we had three i's. And they're Hermitian conjugate of each other. Give me that again. They're the Hermitian conjugate of each other. Yeah, this is the emission conjugate of the operator. This is an operator, this is a emission conjugate. Of the same operator. And one yeah, operator. well, except with primes, yeah. And what's uh, simple is that uh, the Annihilation operators commute with each other, and the creation operators <coughs> commute with each other. <coughs> so we have a lambda k, a lambda prime k prime, commutated zero, a bag of, well, you just take the commission and joint of this, and you get. Is that zero? Now, um, life isn't trivial in momentum space, though. And in fact, we're going to have some these circular polarization vectors associated with momentum k. What are they going to be? It's 1 over root 2, a 3 by 3 rotation matrix on 1 plus or minus i0. So these are the circular polarization unit vectors. Those vectors that are that I wrote, one plus or minus i, zero, these are these are the polarization vectors in the z direction. In other words, this is one over root two, r of k. This is a three by three matrix. Is that r? R of K, the cosine sine matrix, just the rotation. I don't want to get anyone here, yeah. Um, <laughs> what did you say? Nope. 
R of K, is that just the rotation matrix? Yes. Yes, it's three by three rotation matrix, and this is acting on epsilon plus or minus of K Z hat. And I lied. This is the one over root two goes. Because it's one over root two times this that's that. Okay, now how can we represent these commutation relations? Well, we can write AI of T and X as a sum lambda equals plus or minus integral left bracket epsilon lambda of K A lambda of K in the I K X plus epsilon star lambda of k, a lambda dagger of k, e to the minus i kx. And then dq k, and the standard factor, this caused some arbitrariness here, two pi cubed. There are various notations, two omega k. What's omega k? Well, omega k is just length. In natural units, it's just length of the vector k. It's the momentum. We're talking photons. So, um, and then what about pi? Well, pi is just a dot. And so that just brings down an i k on i k zero or an i omega, this is also k zero. And uh, so pi is all of this with, so let me write it down for you. Pi i t x is then some lambda integral bracket. And now what you have is, it's a time derivative, but there's a minus sign on the time. So it's minus i omega epsilon lambda a lambda e to the i k x um, plus i epsilon lambda star a lambda dagger e to the minus i k x u k over square root of i q uh, and two omega and there's an omega here that I love. So that's what pi is. And um, all right, I'm going to assign a homework problem here. Just um, it'll be due, say, a week from Wednesday. And um, take these expansions. Take these commutation relations and show that you get this now. I don't know, maybe, maybe this is harder than I think. Um, because after all, these, these uh, polarization vectors involve this rotation matrix, which is a little bit complicated. By the way, I should say something about this rotation matrix. There's some ambiguity here. Namely, if you're rotating the vector z hat into the vector, or k z hat into the vector k, there are many ways of doing it. So for example, you can rotate about the z-axis first, then rotate to k, and then rotate about the k-axis. So you've effectively got some ambiguity here. Um, the way I just said it, it looks as though we have two rotations, uh, two extra rotations of ambiguity, but in fact, um, it amounts really only to one ambiguity. So what you do is you define once and for all what you mean <coughs> by what you mean by R, a 
and that defines your set of polarization vectors. It doesn't really matter what your standard three by three rotation is. You just have to pick one, and then that'll be it. So we'd be placing this uh, problem online. Give me that again. So you'd be putting this problem online. online. Um, you know, after I burned us all with that um, homework problem that I designed that I thought was, was going to be easy, the harmonic oscillator path into home. Let me think about it. Don't, get, don't start working on this I mean, uh, until I have thought about it a little more because I want to make sure that this doesn't turn into a, uh, you know, a megathon. So let's, let, let's relax for a minute. But the, the answer is it's true that if you have these expansions, these definitions, these commutation relations, you get this as your commutation relation. All right, now, as I say, I, I want to do this in terms of coherent states but I, I think I should first um, lay tech it and get all the bugs out before doing it in class. So let me instead um, now go to um, what is basically the standard treatment. And let me think, where is some good board space? I guess I'll go over there. Um, so I'm sh shifting now to um, chapter Section 13 of Chapter 16 of the book. Uh, well, basically, it's just a chapter on path integrals. And um, so I'm going to actually, well, that's a pity. I just erased Helen. Sorry, let me just rewrite this. Okay, so this is our Hamiltonian, and this thing is the Coulomb term. Okay. Here, let me move this really out of the way. 
Thank you. Uh, so this is this is the product over space of delta of del dot a of x. So that's a product, not f. Excuse me. The pi is a product. Pi is product. And moreover, it's even worse than that because it would actually be it's a product over space time. Because we're insisting that this be true at all times. So is this delta symbol mean here? Is it any possible part of the divergence thing? Say that again? This delta symbol, does that mean it's divergence? No, not the delta symbol, the other one. It's the curly delta. Does that mean this is a direct delta function? What does that apply in this? Thing? It's a drag delta function of del dot a at the space time point x. Right. So would that be if you were to put that into a um, integral, as we say? It, would, it means that when you integrate over dA, it forces a to be transverse at all times, everywhere. All these gauge fields are completely transverse. So you're only integrating a to transverse a. So you're just integ integrating over the transverse A rather than all that? Yes. And, um, all right, so uh, let's see, I mean, O equals some. You've got to ask a question. I was just checking. Sometimes chocolate comes, sometimes it doesn't. Do you have a question? Actually, I do, yes. Um, can, you, uh, can you explain what that means, of course, integration over transverse A, and how that works? Well, it, I mean, there are two ways of thinking of it. One way is that you're integrating over all of the fields, but you've got this delta function that enforces transversality. Now, in fact, as I said, I'm going to try on Wednesday to uh, do things in terms of the coherent state. And then we'll be starting with something that's, ex we'll be starting with things that are explicitly transverse, these circular polarized, circularly polarized photon creation annihilation operators together with the coherent states, which form a complete set. And um, in some ways, this is a more honest way of doing um, half of those. Um, So why do you keep calling them circularly polarized as opposed to linearly? Yeah. I mean, you could choose either uh, one, it seems. Your, 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 all right. I guess what would happen is if you, if you consider one mode of this radiation field, um, then what is the, what would the electric field be? Well, it's effectively this thing here. So it's an I, um, an omega, an epsilon, lambda. And then there's an A dagger over here. Okay. So um, the electric field, X and T here, what would it be? It would be this. I, and I'm leaving out <coughs> constants. <coughs> so we have this kind of an electric field. Okay. And um, so what does that, that, now is that, somehow circular. Um, what that would mean is that the, okay, that would mean that the real part goes around, right? And um, and so what is it? This is an I minus of course one zero. Let's just do the one moving in the C direction. So it looks like this. 
and uh, it's E to the minus I ZK plus I omega T. Um, and the, so where's the real part of this? Well, the real part is in the y direction to start with, which is good because it's moving in the x or in the z direction. But then um, you get that multiplied by that. So let me see if I can even do it. I think it's going to work out. Um, I, I just wonder, do I have to keep this? If we just keep the... Anyway, it's, 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 this is going to be I cosine, or let's see, maybe I can even do the, 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 the if we're looking at the real part of this, then this is sine omega t minus zk with a minus sign, and then minus or plus cosine omega t minus zk, zero. Hmm. So um, this, is, this is something that's going around in the xy plane, isn't it? And um, in fact, let me assign an extra credit problem for one of you guys. Uh, for All right, here's the extra credit problem. What I wrote down was Weinberg's formula. Shrednicki puts the star over here. My question is, who's right? Okay. In other words, you want the. In other words, so so to figure that out, you have to. I mean, I showed you sort of what the electric field would be. Um, the question then is, what's the convention for circularly polarized, for positive circular polarization? What's the convention for negative circular polarization? And my suspicion is that in the literature there are two conventions and they're equally common. Um, I, I don't know if that's true, but I would not be surprised. Um, it's so, um, question would then be which, which one is, is, is right. And Shrednick, you may be following one Weinberg the other. I, in general, it's better to bet on Weinberg. But, um, let's see, maybe we should stop for a story at this point. <coughs> All right. Um, I can tell you one Weinberg story. Uh, this I heard from uh, one of my colleagues at Boston Chandler. Um, he was at Berkeley as a graduate student when Weinberg was a, maybe even an assistant professor there. And um, Weinberg had just left Columbia. And the rumor I heard was that he and Lee crossed swords. And Lee had, and, and for that reason, Weinberg left uh, Columbia went to Berkeley. Where he wrote some marvelous papers, went to MIT, wrote some even better papers, went to Harvard, won a Nobel Prize, asked the dean for a raise. The dean said, Why do you think you deserve a raise? And Weinberg said, Well, I just won the Nobel Prize in physics. And the dean said, Well, we expect Harvard professors to win Nobel Prizes. And so Weinberg went. Texas at Austin, where they have uh, oil money. Uh, now, this, by the way, I was not in the room with these people, so I'm reporting the rumor, whether it's true or not. So, uh, this was the rumor. This was the rumor. Just going around Harvard at the time. Um, so, 
let's see, I started out that story talking about Bob Weinberg and Lee. Lee. And he went to Berkeley. Oh, yes. So at Berkeley, Tolson's wife was working in the library. I guess she was a graduate student. was a graduate student. And um, she said that most people came to the library and the math professors would come, they'd take out a math book. Physics professors would come, they'd take out a physics book. Weinberg would come, he'd take out a math book, a physics book, a chemistry book, a history book, book on poetry, um, and possibly some uh, fiction, various books of fiction, fiction, thrillers, uh, novels, and so forth, carry that load home and back two weeks later do something similar. And so, so she was struck by the fact that his, that his interest was so broad. Cool. Uh, Let's see, any, any other story that I can quickly tell you? Um, I, I can't think of one, so I guess, I guess it'll be a short story today. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's go back to uh, this punk story. Good. Um, okay, so what we've got here is something that is rather awkward. It has all these funny things in it that we don't really like so much. Um, in particular, what is this S sub C? This um, S sub C of A is an integral a half A dot squared minus a half curl of A squared plus A dot J Uh, plus any matter uh, Lagrange density, d fourth x minus an integral of v coulomb dt, because v coulomb already has a uh, time integral, a space integral in it. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. This doesn't look a Lorentz invariant. None, neither does any of that, and so it's kind of a mess. All right. But, because we've got these path integrals, we can do all sorts of cute things. The first is that we introduce a fudge factor f. This is a path integral dA0. Remember, there's no A0 in here, it's gone. There are three A's that we're integrating over here. Now we bring A0 back in, but in the following way, e to the i integral a half grad A0 minus grad inverse Laplacian J0 squared d fourth x. All right, inverse Laplacian, what does this mean? Well, let me write it down for you then. Uh, in fact, I, I imagine that I should have done that in these notes. What is the inverse Laplacian? Well, it's something such that Laplacian on inverse Laplacian would be delta function. So that means that inverse Laplacian, of course, is just basically the Green's function for the Laplacian. And so inverse Laplacian as a function of x and y x minus y is an integral dqk over 2 pi cubed, 1 over k squared, e to the i k dot x minus y. Okay, because when you hit this with Laplacian, um, in fact, there's a minus sign here. You hit this thing with a Laplacian, that pulls down a minus k squared, and then this is just a delta function. Okay. So this is the inverse of Laplacian. And so this is actually an integral operator. This thing here is 
gradient A0 of x minus gradi x gradient of integral, well, let us just call this g of x and y. Then this is uh, integral g of x and y, dqy, j0 of y. So that's what this thing is. G of x and y being this thing. Right. So J0 of y is not being integrated? That... <coughs> J0 of y is not being integrated? Yeah, you know, it's in there, it's in there. J0. Alright, here, I'll write it in a more standard way. And just to avoid the viruses, I'm going to bring this.
So let me just see what I've got here in my notes. Sorry, where'd you get the A0 with the plus and the inverse plus and J0 from? I'm sorry, say that again. How did you modify it? That term into a zero Laplacian inverse Laplacian j zero. I'm sorry. Which part? There's so many manipulations here. I don't yeah. know which one you're How did you um, alter del a zero the second term that the to the right of where you're pointing? I took the. The dot product of these two, it's grad A0 yeah. dotted into gradient of inverse yeah. Laplacian J0. I understand that. But how did you get a, a Laplacian inverse Laplacian out of that? Okay, this I, I integrated by parts, yeah. dropping surface term, and I got A0 Laplacian inverse Laplacian J0. So that's A0 J0. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Laplacian inverse Laplacian gives you a delta function. So in order to get a0, j0, you have to do the integral. So is that a0, j0 outside of the integral? Hold on. This is a student. Unless you ask a question. Oh, hell. <laughs> So my question was, uh, is that a0 or j0 outside of the integral? Because the no, it's inside this integral. We should just have a delta function. Yeah, right? you need a delta function then. Because if Laplacian inverse Laplacian gives you delta function. Okay. Well, all right, all right. Let's let, let me. All right. What do we have happening here? We have gradient a0 of x. I'll leave out time. And then gradient. Of let us say g of x and y, j zero y, d cubed y. All right? Hmm. All right. Now integrate by parts, and we get a zero x with a minus sign minus Laplacian g of x y. J zero y d cube y. So then this um, gives us minus a zero of x delta x minus y j zero y. And so that's minus a zero x j zero x if you do the d cube y integrate that. Good question. All right, so let's, so that, so if, if, if we start with the plus sign, we get minus, and then we got a plus there. Okay, now what happens to this term? <coughs> well, it's two terms like this. We integrate one gradient by parts, and we get a Laplacian, but a minus sign. These camps, we get a J0. So we then have minus a half J0 inverse Laplacian J0. So that's what this F is. And unfortunately, my notes, I have a minus sign here. I have this one is right, but I have a minus sign here. Um, let's try to figure out which sign is right. Um, 
What we want is, first of all, this term is, this is I equal d cubed x, one half grad a zero squared. That's the first term. Now, in my notes, I have minus j0 a0 instead of plus. And then I have plus i v coulomb. Integral v coulomb dt, in fact. So, um, Let's look at inverse Laplacian over there. <clears throat> ah, there's a minus sign lurking in inverse Laplacian. Inverse Laplacian is minus 1 over 4 pi x minus y, right? <clears throat> so this term here is a half j0x j0y over 4 pi x minus y. That's what this term is because of the minus sign. And then So this thing here with the minus, this, this has a minus sign in it. So this thing is this, and that's V Coulomb. So we've got V Coulomb. The only question is, is this a plus sign or minus sign? I think it's a plus sign. Huh? Right, wait, sorry. Let's see which one. I think I, I a have a sign. plus sign here, but yet my notes have a minus sign. <laughs> yeah, I take a degree and it brings down an I as well. It brings down an I squared. Or I take a plus and brings down an huh? Oh, so that minus sign goes away when you take a little plus in. Because there's. When you E to the IK this, this is the inverse of Laplacian. It has a minus sign. And so it's minus 1 over 4 pi x minus y. Because, I mean, here's the formula that you learned in college. Minus Laplacian 1 over 4 pi x minus y equals delta cubed of x minus y. So this thing, minus 1 over, this inverse of Laplacian is just minus 1 over 4 pi x minus 1. Yeah. So I think it's plus i. Now what bothers me here is, and I'm getting a plus. Well, where is the minus in your notes coming from? Like if you trace it back up. Well, unfortunately, I say by integrating by parts, we can write the number f as exercise 16.20. <laughs> There's a problem. Point is that we 
want eventually this thing to be a half that, that, and then the V Coulomb. The V Coulomb then um, is coming in with it just has one eye. There aren't two eyes here. And um, the result is that this thing combines with this action over here. To give us the following S prime of A, which is integral a half A dot squared, well that's that term, a half curl A squared. This term, a dot j, then minus a zero j zero, and then we had here a minus v coulomb. We've got a plus v coulomb there; it cancels, and so our s prime is simply this plus whatever the matter Lagrange density is. P4 does. So this is the uh, this is what we get. And now, just to show you that we're almost done, what we do is we add a term that's zero. We add a term del dot a dot times a zero to this action. Why can we do that? Well, it's zero because this is transverse. And um, that's the same thing as minus a dot dot grad a zero. So we can add that without any trouble. But now, oh, and I left something out. There's a term here. Uh, plus a half grad a zero squared, which was this thing over here. That was the term that we always knew we had and wasn't a term put any sign ambiguity. So we've got this term, this term, and then we add this term. So we can combine them together and we have one half a dot minus grad a zero squared minus one half curl a squared plus a dot j minus a zero j zero d fourth x. So now the Coulomb term is gone, and this is the gauge invariant form e squared minus b squared. So we're back to the gauge a gauge invariant action. And this is a Lorentz invariant in the product, a dot j minus a zero j zero. All right, this is a good place to stop. And um, let me just emphasize, as you're walking out, I'll just emphasize something that, um, remember last time when I was talking about uh, covariant and contravariant and I defined them very simply, <laughs> things that transform like dxi are contravariant. Things that form like transform like derivatives are covariant. Uh, a dot product of a covariant with a contravariant is invariant. And then I said that is all mathematics. What is the physics? Well, the physics is comes in saying what is the relationship between covariant and contravariant vectors and um, or equivalently, what is it that's invariant? And um, in special relativity, it's just this. P0, P dot x minus P0, x0. In more, more generally, it's P A x B. GAB. So in other words, there's something that you use to, to make x 
covariant, so the thing is invariant, you can lower it with a metric. So the physics is in the metric. And then what Einstein did was to write down the equations of the field. All right, so 